Hello, this is Wes Fryer. Today is April the 20th, 2012, and I'd like to record and share just a few comments, some really positive feedback from today's Digital Learning Summit that we had in Oklahoma City that was hosted by the State Department of Education. But I'd also like to offer some uh, suggestions for our focus that we need to have as we move forward talking about digital learning. For those of you that are seeing this and not familiar with what's happening now in April of 2012 in Oklahoma, um, we have um, had a significant regime change in our Department of Education and also uh, in state government, as many states have. And part of the changes that have been brought about by um, our current state superintendent, uh, Janet Barisi, involve an agenda which is called the Digital Learning Now Agenda. And uh, you can Google Digital Learning Now and you can see uh, the roadmap for change that um, is proposed um, in today's summit, or actually this week's, which lasted a half day yesterday on Thursday and then all day today. Uh, we were you know, breaking up into some different groups. I was in a, the high quality content group. And in a lot of cases, groups were taking a look at specific things on the roadmap for digital learning now uh, that are recommended as changes in state law uh, to open the door to different kinds of opportunities and interactions and um, uh, commercialization in some cases of, of education. Uh, some really big, big changes. So I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about digital learning now, and I'm going to recommend some reading sources. Um, among those, I'm going to uh, talk about um, several different books, uh, Disrupting Class by Clayton Christensen, Liberating Learning by Mo and Chubb, and Todd Manderark's Getting Smart. I actually do have the e-version of some of those books, um, but uh, it, for different reasons, I've got paper-based versions too. So let me begin by saying this is not a Republican message or a Democratic message. Um, I know a lot of different folks may, may see this uh, message, and I want you to know that my intent and focus um, is certainly what is best for our kids. I'm very invested in education here in Oklahoma with three of my own children in public non-charter schools here in the Oklahoma City school system. And um, I really believe that the changes that we're in the middle of are extremely exciting. They afford us a lot of opportunities, but we need to be careful uh, not, to, not to go the wrong direction. And uh, we've had some different initiatives in our country for um, political and, and educational change moving for quite a while. We see some of those in, in the proposals and the actual legislative change that we've had in Oklahoma. So first off, let me amplify and really celebrate some of the great things that happened at our Digital Learning Summit. First of all, Superintendent Barisi did a fantastic job, I think, highlighting some of the wonderful examples of digital learning and digitally infused learning that are taking place in our schools. If you're not familiar with how public schools, it was awesome to hear uh, Superintendent Barisi talk about her visit out to how they have been and continue to be um, really shining stars of innovation and um, blended learning, not for the sake of using technology, but to open up new doors of opportunity for their kids. The project-based learning initiative that How Public Schools has been embarking on this year builds on years of focus on blended learning and technology integration, one-to-one -one learning, and so that was really, really awesome. Um, one of the things that I have observed the last two times that I have seen Superintendent Barisi speak um, at our Oklahoma Technology Association Conference at our, and at our Oklahoma Distance Learning Conference was really just a focus on um, other states. And so amidst change, and we definitely have a lot of changes that we do need in our schools and ways that we need to move forward and embrace digital technology and learning opportunities, it's very important that we remember to celebrate innovative educators and to highlight those within our state. So that was awesome. Um, the second thing I want to point out is this was a great example of a State Department of Education embracing the use of social media and you know you, live Ustream broadcasting. Um, I'm recording this today, obviously, to be sharing on YouTube. And for the past several years, I've utilized Ustream quite a bit in different capacities. In fact, uh, to lecture cast, which wasn't really the, the thing that all students want, but to be able to document, uh, you know, with video, things that we're doing in class, broadcast, you know, from different places. And so we had live Ustream, we had a Twitter uh, hashtag, and I will include in, the in both the blog post, which you may be reading and finding this video, or if you're on the YouTube video itself, I'll include in the description some links to um, the, the Twitter 
uh, stream, I'll probably create a Storify uh, archive of, of those tweets. So it was really, really great and a good opportunity to allow different members of the community who were both able to attend in person and those who couldn't and were at a distance to be able to participate. So that was awesome. Um, as I mentioned, we definitely do need to embrace digital learning. Um, this is not a new agenda, but it is wonderful, I think, to see our um, State Department of Education really focused on the promise of digital learning for students as well as for teachers and for our, our state and our communities. We also need new evaluation systems, and one of the things that's been going on in our state is um, the adoption of a new, what's called Teacher Leader Effectiveness Program, or TLE program. And our past system had been very antiquated. Even the basic idea of having a reflection, you know, that teachers would have, you know, hasn't been a part of that. And so it's really important that we, uh, we, we improve in a lot of different ways. However, um, there, it's, the changes that we're seeing in Oklahoma right now are very contentious for different reasons. And um, so the best quotation I heard, I think, uh, at the end was from Superintendent Barisi, where she said, it's time for us to stop saying, let's be like state so-and-so. Let's create the best schools uh, and, and the best solutions for our students here in Oklahoma. And we definitely have a lot to learn from a lot of places. Um, I hope we'll learn a lot more from Montana as an example. I think we're becoming a lot more, or have the potential of looking a lot more like the state of Washington, you know, than, than uh, Montana or the state of Florida with these kinds of changes. But overall, it's great to have this focus. And what I'd like to do now is look at four specific things that we need to recognize and keep in mind as we sort of move forward on, on this path. Because it's clear that there's a lot of political will and a lot of momentum uh, to enact not only additional legislative change, um, but also potentially bring about, I think, some funding change and some support for um, education and digital education in Oklahoma that we desperately need. The first thing that I wanna point out is that online assessment and testing kids online is not the reason to go one-to-one -one and to embrace a one-to-one -one learning initiative. I've worked quite a bit in my academic career with different schools that have embraced one-to-one -one learning. I've written grants in Texas for the Text Tip Project and worked with some of those schools. I've been doing some work recently in the state of Maine. I was in Yarmouth awesome, awesome school district for so many reasons, mainly the people that are involved there in, in helping, uh, you know, shepherd and facilitate learning for students. And unfortunately, the trajectory that we are on in Oklahoma and many other folks in the nation may be on, in part because of the Common Core State Initiative, the uh, Standard Initiative, is this idea that man, we've got to, to be testing kids more online and electronic. We need to put a digital device in everybody's hand so we can test and assess them in a high stakes way. And I'm gonna talk more about balanced assessment and high stakes accountability in my third point. But this is the first thing to recognize. When you look at one-to-one -one learning and the reason why so many different states and communities, um, well, I guess we can't say too many states because Maine is, a, is definitely an anomaly, but the, the schools and the communities and the states who have embraced one-to-one -one learning have not done it by standing up and saying, boy, I want us to be able to test all our kids online because we know if we have high stakes testing even more than we're doing now, we're gonna have great schools and great educational quality. So that needs to, I think, be at the front of this because part of what we're talking about here is not just virtual education and online learning options and online content, we're also talking about devices and putting those in the hands of students, which is awesome uh, because we need to do that. We need to have a mobile you know, learning device, wireless, you know, digitally internet connected learning device in the hands of our students immediately. Um, and, and we need to do that as a state and it's gonna be challenging to do, but we don't need to do it just so we can have high stakes testing um, and online testing. So point number two, we did hear this from Richard Collada, who was a wonderful opening keynote speaker yesterday. He is with the U.S. Department of Education, actually had worked with the CIA. He's a former Spanish teacher, really enjoyed his comments. And he talked about how important it is to support teachers and to emphasize the importance of teachers. I'll say it this way. High quality experiences depend on high quality people. And we absolutely cannot imagine and hope 
to have a world an, an even better world class educational system in our country without the top folks, the best people we can in the profession of education. And if you spend much time in classrooms and schools in Oklahoma, particularly these last couple weeks when our testing window has been open, it is a very stressful, high pressure, and not a very positive environment because of high stakes testing and accountability. And so I want to see us as a state emphasize the importance of the teacher and also the importance of compensating teachers at a high level. We value, um, and we can see what we value as a state and as citizens, in a large part by what we fund. We'll talk about being able to look at your calendar and your schedule and seeing where your priorities are. And we had a big push about two years ago, a year and a half ago in Oklahoma called Proposition 744, which was to try and bring our average funding for our students and therefore our compensation you know, for teachers up to the level um, that would be average of the five states that are around us. And we had a very distressing situation where Chambers of Commerce, business groups rose up and said, no, we do not want to pay anything else for education in Oklahoma. Now, as I record this in April of 2012, I certainly recognize that we're in a challenging funding situation in our country. But we cannot accept the current status quo of funding in education as number one, the acceptable norm, and number two, the prescri prescription for where we need to be. Um, I looked just a few years ago, um, well, maybe about a year ago, at going back into the classroom as a teacher. It is shocking how little we are paying teachers in the state of Oklahoma. And so my point here um, is that we need to reject the assumption that we're, we can only have flat or declining budgets. One of the things that was put out as an assumption today is that we can't have any more money for education. The money we do have you know, needs to be re-diverted re and, and put into different places. Um, and so we have got to have the, the best people we can in the room with our students and also virtually interacting with our students in blended and fully online um, situations. And so I want to see advocacy for the best principals that we can get, the best superintendents and the best teachers. You know, it takes a courageous leader and someone who is willing to make tough decisions to deal with a situation where somebody's not doing their job or they're, they're, they're not doing their job well and they need to be on an improvement plan and maybe they're going to need to seek another career. We do have issues in education uh, where we've, we need folks to, to find other professions or to really improve their game. And what it's going to take to do that is not just a new teacher leader effectiveness system, not just new standards and new testing. It's going to take great leadership. And we need state leaders that are going to inspire this next generation of, uh, of teachers and educators and administrators to be able to step up to that challenge. And I don't hear that today, and we need to hear that. Point number three is balanced assessment. We have been in love politically in our country for a number of years with high stakes testing. And as an educator and a teacher, I know that assessment is absolutely critical to the learning process. We do assessment all the time if we're doing good uh, instruction and we're providing good learning opportunities for, for our students. But here's the thing. There's an assumption today that the only way we can move this agenda forward is with high stakes testing where we're going to be grading teachers based upon student test scores. And number two, we're going to need to uh, be doing this online and we're going to need to pay millions of dollars to commercial vendors to create these amazing artificial intelligence enhanced assessments that are just going to be great. Folks, we do not need to pour millions and millions of dollars into the pockets of vendors who are providing different kinds of high stakes accountability solutions for us. We need to be investing far more in people, in professional development, and in developing our capacity to create a, a 21st century and a, a cutting edge world-class educational system. Look at Finland, 
Have you done that? We hear that bandied about quite a bit. And when you look at, at how folks in Finland are paying their teachers, the amount of investment they're giving to their educational system, it is radically different than what we have right now in the state of Oklahoma. So we have got to replace a focus on high stakes accountability with a focus on balanced assessment. We need digital portfolios for all students. Lots of things that were talked about today, like students writing more, students publishing more, changing, this is my favorite quote from Tom Vander Ark today, changing uh, turn it in to publish it. Absolutely. I mean, my work with playing with media and mapping media to the common core in the curriculum, it's all about this idea of students becoming publishers and content creators, and I'm 100% on that page. But the page I'm not on is this high stakes accountability. And I really need to get the specific minutes of our TLE commission report that happened either in October or November of 2011 when the date, one of the data gurus from the state of Florida was testifying before our TLE commission. And uh, one of the things that they talked about was how many teachers uh, actually don't teach in a grade level that has a high stakes test. And the statistic that I've been told was 70% and that's for Florida. So 70% of teachers in Florida don't teach a grade level or a content area that has a high stakes test, yet they're looking at giving a large significant percentage of that teacher's evaluation based on those student test scores. Um, that is ridiculous. It is immoral and it is wrong and we should not support this. So we've got to embrace balanced assessment that needs to be part of the language that we speak of politically when we talk about testing and we have got to end high stakes testing in Oklahoma. And that doesn't mean that we don't have, you know, end of instruction exams for different courses. That doesn't mean that we don't take the ACT and the PSAT and, and, and other kinds of assessments. But what it means we stop doing is making public education and the purpose of public education testing. And we see it very clearly right now where kids are like, oh, well, what do we do now? Why, why are we here? Because testing is over. We've got to help every student and every teacher and every parent and every legislator and every member of our community, everyone, understand that we're in education and we're in, in school for learning. And learning's a process that never ends. We assess at lots of different points, but this whole idea of high stakes accountability and testing is bad for students, it is bad for teachers, it inherently corrupts the profession, um, and I, we, there's you know various individuals that have pointed that out before, and I just, I feel so passionate about that. Balanced assessment, all right. Point number four is we've gotta grapple head on with poverty. One of the things that wasn't mentioned at all today, and it's really not part of the educational discussions in our country right now, is the importance of facing poverty and, and confronting it and recognizing the fundamental issue which education can and does play in helping people rise out of poverty. One of the things that um, our church has been involved in in Edmond the last couple years is a ministry that's a collaboration with several other churches and community groups to reach out to Rolling Green, which is a low-income housing area really close to our church. There have been a lot of great relationships that have come out of that and a lot of insight. And um, my wife um, had taught in predominantly low socioeconomic schools when we lived in Texas um, has an opportunity now to work with a lot of single mothers and uh, we've got to grapple with poverty. We've got to stop pretending like we can simply give every student a laptop, you know, an iPad, a Chromebook, a MacBook, whatever. Just give them a device with internet connectivity, let them hook up with an online vendor and woohoo, you know, they're all learning wonderfully and perfectly. We all hopefully should know that it's a lot more complicated than that. Yet, I think that's the idea that some people are advancing in this whole idea of virtual education and online learning. So I want to see us confront together as a community uh, the challenges of poverty. We've got important roles to play um, as educators, and we've got schools that, that are, fi are facing incredible challenges, right? Just right here, I can, I can go five minutes from where I am here in Oklahoma City, and we can have radically different situations, um, you know, not just with private schools to public, but even public to public schools. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll close with this thought, and then I'll tell a little bit about the background for reading. 
in this digital learning summit, um, in our breakout session and in some of the, the group sessions, we heard sort of the typical refrain of PISA scores and NAEP scores, testing scores. Wow, look how horrible United States schools are. You know, we've basically, let's blow them up and, and, and start over because we're so bad. With, we've got to take a look at these kinds of statistics in context. It is irresponsible and misleading to not talk about context. For instance, when we look at remediation rates in college and how many more kids are going to college today than ever before. It's, it's misleading to talk about test scores in a particular school or a particular district or state without looking at demographic changes. And again, looking at poverty. Um, it's, it's vital that we look at research and that we look at the ways in which we need to be informed uh, by academic research. And one of the ways that we need to do that is um, by, by not just beating up teachers and creating this perception and, and feeding this perception that our schools are terrible. Let me tell you something. We have incredible public school teachers right now all over the place doing an amazing job. And we've got to stand up for those public teachers. We can't continue to demonize public ed and somehow suggest that if we simply blow up the system, we're going we're gonna to have this wonderful new world where everybody's learning on a laptop and everybody's going to Harvard. We have got to invest in our people. We've got to support our people. And we also have to recognize that it, you know, this isn't something that we're just simply going to be able to legislate. Poverty is really, really challenging to confront and to deal with. Uh, so let's continue to celebrate the innovators. Let's, you know, continue to talk about the benefits of blended learning. Um, but number one, let's make sure we recognize why we want to embrace one-to-one -one learning. And it is because of digital literacy. It is because of equity issues. It is because of cost issues. It is because we can have, you know, multimedia presentations of content and we can be inter more interactive. All of those are right reasons. But online state assessment and high stakes testing is not the reason. Um, we've got to focus on our people. We've got to bring the best people we can into education. And we've got to pay those folks not just reasonable amounts, but we've got to compensate educators well. And we need to change that in the state of Oklahoma. We need to talk about balanced assessment and we need to face poverty. So that's my soapbox. What I'd like to conclude with quickly is just a little bit on background reading. Not because I agree with every idea in, in these books that I'm going to share with you, but because they're challenging and they are definitely informing um, our state leaders here in Oklahoma and they very well could be where you live. Um, first thing is take a look at digital learning now. This is a very interesting program and I think we need to be informed at how digital learning now is being used not only by policymakers and elected officials in Oklahoma, but in other places to enact some really big reforms and some really big changes in state law, some of which are good and some of which are terrible. Um, I would say that, you know, evaluating teachers on the basis of student test scores is in that terrible box. Um, you know, giving greater flexibility to schools for the purchase of instructional materials and not just printed textbooks would be in the good side. You know, there's, so there's, a, there's a mix. This is a group that Tom Vander Ark explained today, uh, got together in Florida, and Bob, former governors Bob Wise and Jeb Bush are the leaders of this, and about 100 people put together this agenda and identified specific things that, that they recommend for legislative change. This is a specific roadmap, and as we think about the kinds of changes we want to see in our schools, I think we can really, you know, take some notes here because literally we're using this as a blueprint in Oklahoma. We haven't voted on it. We didn't debate about it as a state. You know, our, our elected officials said, here, this is what we're going to do. Um, and, and I think there's going to be a lot of positive. There is a lot of positive coming from that. But you definitely need to take a look at this uh, and be aware of it because this is shaping many of our discussions and policies today in Oklahoma, and it could be for you as well in your state. Um, let me recommend a few books. Uh, this is Disrupting Class by Clayton Christensen. It's co-authored by Michael Horn and Curtis Johnson. I got to hear Michael Horn present in Austin, I want to say two years ago at the Cozen Conference. And this is the whole idea that we're going to reach this tipping point of online education and, you know, turn around and say, oh, my gosh, look what, look, look what has happened. Online education has really supplanted a lot of face-to-face -face instruction. And so uh, these authors are, you know, very much on similar pages, I think, to the Digital Learning Now people. 
Uh, this is a challenging book. It's an important book. Um, and I would say of the three books, four book, three that I'll share with you, I'm probably more in agreement, you know, with this kind of a book. But it's going to take, and I think all these authors would agree, you know, leaders, both educational leaders and then more generally political leaders, um, to decide how we're going to implement this change. Tom Vander Ark talked about that well today, saying we are moving to digital learning. We're moving to digital devices. We're moving to digital content. And I think he compared it to jujitsu, maybe. You know, you, you're not going to be able to change it, but you can redirect it and, and determine how it's going to happen in your state uh, and in your locality. So Disrupting Learning or Disrupting Class, a good book. Second book I'd recommend, um, Tom Vander Ark is the, is the person who our state superintendent, Janet Barisi, has brought in uh, to keynote last summer's uh, Innovations Conference, which is a summer uh, leadership conference. He was our luncheon keynote today for day two. Um, I think he has a lot of important and good things to say. Um, Tom Vander Ark, however, is a venture capitalist and he um, was a school superintendent. Interestingly, reading his book, um, all the teachers in his district went on strike the first day that he arrived. Um, so, you know, somebody who's, who's been involved in some, some definite controversy and some definite changes in school systems, um, I think, like all of these voices, it's important to take this into consideration. Um, but I wouldn't consider Tom Vander Ark um, to be certainly the only voice um, that we need to be taking a look at and listening to. And I think it's important that our conversations are not in exclusively vendor driven. There's incredibly large amounts of money on the table. And I'm going to include a link in the video notes and this uh, post notes to um, a TED talk that was given recently talking about the gold rush that's happening right now for online curriculum. Um, and that will take me to my third book recommendation, Liberating Learning by Chubb and Mo. Now, um, part of, you know, I think part and parcel of the agenda that we're seeing playing out here in Oklahoma is based upon these three books. And so these are important to read. But let's take this back a little bit because this wasn't the first book that I've read by Chubb and Mo. Let's go back to 1995. This is a book that I uh, had to purchase as curriculum for my master's program um, at Texas Tech. And uh, one of the articles I had to report on was America's Public Schools, Choice is a Panacea by John Chubb and Terry Moe. And this was from uh, the Brookings Review in the summer of 1990, talking about how we need to have vouchers in the United States and that if we would only let the market provide the solutions, you know, we're going to have we're going to have good schools and we're going to have high quality. What we're seeing with liberating learning and to a degree getting smart, especially with liberating learning, is um, a constituency in America that basically is, is in some ways hijacking blended learning for the cause of, you know, let's break education down into how, how much does each student worth and then let's open it up to commercial interests so that vendors can have a piece of the pie and that we can break public education and in the process um, a lot of companies will be able to get very wealthy and, and very rich because we're going to you know, open the faucet of public dollars and that's going to be flowing substantially to you know, private groups and private corporations. That's a big part of this agenda and so I'm going to refer you to that TED talk. We absolutely need to continue to work with vendors and to embrace the opportunities that our entrepreneurial capitalist environment provides for us in the United States and around the world. But I think it's very, very important that we think about the value of public education. We think about special education. We think about meeting the needs of each child and not living in some fantasy world that says, oh gosh, if we have the market you know, provide, then suddenly everybody will just go to the best schools and the bad schools will all get better. You know, We've got John Marshall um, High School and actually it goes from sixth grade up just down the street. Um, and, you know, that school has got to be an excellent school for every student that goes to it. Um, at, you know, that, this is true for public schools and, and for private schools as well. I do not have all the answers. I do have a lot of ideas. If you've stayed with me to listen to my rambling, I appreciate it. Again, I want to express appreciation to our State Department of Education for hosting this Digital Learning Summit. I think there's a lot of good conversations that are going to come out uh, of this continuing dialogue that we have. And I think it's really, really important um, that we, we become well-informed, not only about what the current proposals are, but you know where, where do these proposals come from and what are the implications for our communities, for our families, and for our schools. 
education is incredibly important and I hope that you're passionate about education because we all need to be passionate about something and education is certainly a topic that is going to touch all of us, not only for the, our, our families and for our children, you know, but for the folks that are in our community, the people we work with, that we go to church and school with, um, you know, the folks that, that we live with. So we need the best schools that we can and we need to work together um, to be able to uh, create those schools. But the bottom line to a good school is good, they're good people, right? Good teachers. Um, awesome teachers, awesome administrators, uh, willing to step up and do what's required. We're in a challenging environment, but challenging environments are also fraught with opportunity. So I look forward to seeing um, how we're going to move forward together here in Oklahoma. I welcome your comments and feedback to this video. I'd uh, invite you to uh, share a video response. Um, you can do that on YouTube. You can reply with a video. Um, and you can also certainly reply uh, with a comment on the blog post, or you could re reply to me via Twitter. Uh, my Twitter ID is WFryer. So thanks very much for your attention. Have a blessed day.